So we have we have people joining um, and we have a lot to talk about. So let's go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, with me as always is my co-host and the CEO of Mobilization Funding, Scott Pieper. Hi, Scott. Hey, Autumn, thank you. Welcome everybody. And our guests today are, we have uh, Saleh Mubarak, who is an author and keynote speaker in the construction industry. We have Natasha Sherwood, who is the executive director for Independent Electri Electrical Contractors Association of, is it West Florida or Florida? Florida West Coast, but it's, it's everywhere except for four counties. <laughs> <laughs> and we have Matt Vetter, who is the president of Schaefer Construction. Thank you all so much for being here with us. Thank you. Adam. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Um, to kick it off, I would like to ask each of you to share your story on how you got into the construction industry. And also, I want to know whether or not you went to college. Where do we start? I'll start. Um, oh, my name's girl. Natasha. You start. I, I'm like, I'll, I'll just run with it. My name's Natasha Sherwood. How did I get into the construction industry? Um, uh, my dad was a construction attorney, so that's probably how I first got into it as a as a kid. But then um, I was actually a K through 12 principal, and we started um, addressing education needs and found out that in uh, Hillsborough County and in Florida, we were importing more um, construction labor than um, we had, and we were actually paying for DMs. And I got on a task force that ended up um, finding and kind of transferring me to this job with independent electrical contractors. And um, so then really just got uh, in depth with our apprentice program and um, kind of took on a life of its own. So now run the Florida Apprenticeship Association as well, which runs all kinds of construction and all kinds of IT apprenticeships. So that's how I landed here. And yes, I went to college for seven football seasons and received um, a lot of degrees in that time frame, none of which am I using. Likewise, I share a similar story to that. Soleil, do you want to go next? Sure, sure. Well, uh, going to college was was not an option. Uh, my mom was a school principal, very um, tough on us. The, the, the thing is, uh, I have uh, one brother older than me and one sister also older than me, both uh, medical doctors and another sister who's a pharmacist. So there was pressure on me to go to the medical uh, field and I kind of, you know, registered and then this is uh, back uh, in, in my home country in Syria at that time. And then I changed, no, I don't want to be dissecting frogs. And, you know, <laughs> so uh, I changed to civil engineering, which I liked. And in my graduate school here in, in the U.S., I, I, I did my master's degree in structures and mechanics. As a stru I, I had uh, work experience in structural design. And then I found that it's dry subject. You know, you, you're going to sit in by yourself in a cubicle doing design. And I'm, a, I'm, I'm very talkative. I'm a, I like, you know, I'm a people's person. So I found that project management is my cup of tea. And I switched. I did my PhD at Clemson University. So as they say, my blood runs orange. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I love it. And uh, this is new news. Nobody knows except my wife. I signed a contract two days ago with my, <clears throat> my publisher, Whitey, for my third book on wow. construction project management. Very nice. cool. Congrats. That's Congrats. awesome. That's awesome. Good for you. Thank you. So you, you guys are my references. If I need help, Matt, Scott, and Natasha, <laughs> and Autumn, of course, you know, if I need a question in, in construction management, you are my references, please. Sounds great. Always. Absolutely, right. anytime. So uh, with that, I'm, I'm Matt Vetter. Uh, I'm the president of Schaefer Construction. We are a commercial general contracting firm in, in southeastern Michigan. Um, I got my start in construction in my, my late high school days. Um, I started on a residential crew, basically carrying wood around the job sites and, and kind of a, a general laborer. Uh, through that, I've I've worked in and touched almost every type of construction. I, I switched into the commercial realm in right around 2008 uh, when everything was kind of falling apart. I've owned several companies um, and, and now, uh, you know, Schaefer Construction is, is where, I'm, where I'm at. It's my, it's my uh, burn the ships project and uh, we, we aren't looking backwards. So we're uh, rapidly growing and, and having lots of fun doing it. 
Uh, I did go to college. I graduated from U of M, University of Michigan. I have a weird story about my past. We can get into that maybe later, but my degree is in psychology. And uh, I would say I, I actually use it probably every day uh, in what I do now. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, what kind of construction do you do? So we build everything other than single family homes. We do a lot of light industrial, uh, commercial work. We built office space back when people still used them. Um, you name it, we do it. Right. Vertical construction, not, not horizontal. Right, right, right. And for those of you that don't know, I got my start in construction working for my dad. He had a commercial glazer and contract, man, uh, contract glazer doing glass and aluminum. So I would be on those job sites in high school and summers, certainly all through college. And I, like Matt, I just basically did whatever I was told. I carried wood. I peeled the stickers off of the uh, glass. Back when I was doing insulated glass, they actually used to take two panes of glass and a hot rubber gun and insulate it themselves. I know that doesn't exist anymore, but I had plenty of burns from that, as well as peeling all the little stickers off of the glass and carrying it to the polisher and who knows what else, working even on the cutting table. Um, and that definitely helped me understand that I wanted to get into the construction. It was fascinating and I liked it, but I also uh, went to college mostly because I wanted to play basketball when I left high school and I needed somewhere to continue that uh, dream of mine. But um, I ended up getting a degree in marketing and business and food, hotel, hospitality management. And candidly, I probably don't use much of what I learned there. I'm sure I learned some structure. I learned how to make some friends. I learned how to get in trouble. And uh, fortunately, I made my way out. And so that's where I land now. Okay. Yeah. I think that's a good segue into uh, my next question, which is, do you, how, did, how do you use your, your college education now in your construction career? Like Matt, you were talking about that you got a psychology degree, but you feel like you kind of use that every day. So um, whoever wants to go first, just, or, or if you don't use it at all. Matt, you want well, to jump in with psychology? <laughs> yeah, I can, I can touch on that. So I, I do feel like I use it every day. You know, um, my role now is, is the owner and kind of the, the guy leading the ship. You know, I, I deal with everyone from the day laborers on job sites to C-suite executives that, that we're working for. And, you know, and, and in sales and marketing in general, learning the human psyche and, and how, how we all work, how we tick. You know, it's proven to be very helpful. Now, I would be lying to you if I told you that when I was coming out of high school and, and going to school, that going to college, that that was my plan, right? right. I mean, my, my colleagues and my, my coworkers that have degrees, they have construction management degrees or engineering degrees and, you know, normal track educations for what they do. Um, so it, it, it's part luck, I think, and it's part, you know, the universe working for me, but it, uh, it started off really as a, as a, as a field that interested me just on a personal level. And I've been able to kind of take that and spin it to, to help what I do now. And I would say, I said, I didn't use any of it. I saw I have degrees in public relations, sports administration, mass communication and political campaigning. I just thought I would like try to cover all the colleges at the university of Florida and see if I could get something from all of them. And I would, I mean, I would again be remiss to say, I don't use it. I do a lot of legislative and lobbying work, but I'm never running a campaign again in my life. Um, and obviously I'm sitting here on a webinar, so I, I use mass communication, but a lot of what I feel like I use from my experience at in college is the things that I did outside of that I did while I was in college, but it truly was on the job training. So whether it was working in a legislator's office, I worked for the football team and it is that structure. It is that dealing with people. It is the, um, getting things done. And I think that aspect has really transferred into being able to, um, work well in the construction industry that we do, especially coming in from somewhat outside when I came in the past few years is that anywhere I've gone, and, and I probably learned this again, working outside the classroom is learning all the aspects of it. So whether it's the carrying the wood or scraping the stickers off, you know, I was trying to learn. So I would go out to my contractors and, you know, try to figure out what they were doing. And um, I think working with people is the part that I probably learned the most of college. Um, it definitely wasn't learning how to like write the code to do a website back in 1992 because none of that it exists anymore right so um some of that coursework's not there but I think it's the part that I learned outside of the classroom at college that really 
transfers into what we're doing now. I have an interesting story about my using my background. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, there's, there's a match now between my ba educational background and what I do, but what I did in the master's degree was structural design. And I finished that uh, in 1985. So it, it was a long time. Um, and my work, brief work experience was in 82, 83 in, in structural design. Now, fast forward maybe almost 30 years from now. Um, if uh, Natasha, you are in Tampa, right? Correct. Remember when we had the big hurricane? Uh, was it Irma or was it? Uh, I think Irma was. Irma was like 2006 ish time frame. Like no, we had like. The oh no no! It was something was 2016 17. I don't remember exactly, but it oh, it yeah. was. Oh yeah. I remember that. I remember that. Michael. 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 Yeah. Yes, Michael. Yes. So it was funny that um, at that time I was with my mother who, who passed away later on. She lived with my brother and sister in Panama City, Florida. And my uh, children, the you know, all the guys, for they have an annual trip. They went outside the, the United States at that time and they left their wives and kids. And we felt, my wife and I, sorry that the uh, wives and, and uh, we have one daughter and two daughters-in-law, they were uh, without their, their uh, husbands. We have to go back to Tampa. So we drove back and we looked like crazy on the highway. Everyone was leaving Tampa when we were the only vehicle driving Coming back in. to Tampa. The shock was when um, they decided that they wanted to go. So they traveled, all of them, all the you know, ladies with the children, they traveled to, <clears throat> to Atlanta. We have relatives in Atlanta. And I told my wife, I'm not leaving Tampa. So I decided to, with the limited means I had to board my, my glass uh, doors and so on, and I used my structural background, I told my wife, I said, failure happens because of deflections, and the deflections happen in the middle of the pane, you know, talking about glass, uh, right. Scott. So I pulled some furniture, I got some two by fours I had and some boards, and I boarded all my house, I said, I'm not leaving. Um, and we got stuck on the TV waiting for the news. And then, and we prepared and uh, um, walk in closet to sleep in. And then by 11 o'clock PM, I remember the good news that it's not going to be as bad. So. It's hard. <laughs> right. Which is always the thing with hurricanes in, in the Tampa Bay. Well, knock on wood. So far, that has been, I think, oh, the my. last... It's right. because there's um, Jose Gaspar's gold is buried in Tampa Bay and no hurricane can hit. According to my dad, <laughs> forget structural engineering, forget anything else. The whole thing is that Jose's gold is down there somehow helping us. Yeah. Um, I have heard that many times myself. That's why oh, you're also cavalier about it. Yeah. <laughs> I think you guys all touched on a really interesting point. And it's one of the things I want to focus on in this webinar too, is, is the whole fact that it's learning. Like college is a way to learn. And We've also talked about, you know, we all have probably, I guess, by our ages and so like you were nice enough to announce how long you've been working, you've been working, but it's, it's your education over time. It's not just one way, one method and college can be that, but it doesn't have to be that immediately after high school. I can tell you personally, I would have benefited much better learning in college if I went four or five years later. I can also tell you that I've learned more from the books that I've read than I ever did in college, cumulatively, and even, even um, candidly from even some of the experience of certain work experiences I've had, I probably learned more from books. I certainly today in my everyday life, implement, use, and actively apply the things I've learned from a book in my everyday life. Then I, then I could even draw a line to and anything I learned in a classroom or a study. Now, I'm not an accountant or a doctor or a civil engineer, so there's some, there's some perspective to have there. But what I think is that it's the maturity level of going from high school directly into a college and trying to indoctrinate yourself into what do you want to learn. And oftentimes you go to college, you don't even know what you want to major in yet. And I think you couple that with an expensive cost to it. And then you look at the practical nature of what happens when you get out of life economy, jobs, inflation, other things. And you realize quickly that that might not have been the best thing for me at the moment. 
Is there anything that you guys can touch on as to why you think there's a stereotype um, that you have to go do that? And for the people that don't, why don't, why isn't it okay or just as accepted to jump out into that? And I guess let's relate it to construction a little bit too. Scott, I mean, I think it, uh, go ahead. Like, uh, I was going to say, um, I may not agree with you that going to college, well, it, it can happen f f uh, four or five years later, but I would uh, say the United States has very flexible um, academic, uh, you know, system that allows you, and we are the only country as far as know, uh, as far as I know in, in the world, that allows you to go the first year freshman as undeclared. And then the other flexibility is that, okay, let's say you, you chose marketing after two years of studying marketing, you said, that's not for me. I, I like computers, I wanna switch to IT. So they allow you to switch. Yes, you may lose a couple of credits, but at least they um, allow you. Many other systems in, in, in other countries, they don't allow you. But what you say, uh, what you said applies to graduate school um, during my, you know, work as, as a professor, I get people who come to me, uh, want to do a master's degree, and they want me to be there, you know, uh, uh, to supervise their thesis and so on. And I see a profound difference between those who did have work in engineering or construction after the bachelor degree, and then come back later, 10 years later, five years later to do the master's, and those who want to do it immediately after the bachelor degree. I will mention only one difference. Those who don't have experience, they come to me and say, Professor, can you give me a subject to do my thesis on? The others have subjects on mind, and they want me to critique. I want to do this or this. So that's... Uh, but it's very interesting, and I promised Autumn that uh, I have a brief uh, PowerPoint presentation on experience versus education. As much as time allows us, uh, I can I can show you a few uh, slides. Uh, and, I, and I think that's changed some too. Even though, like as I, so I have a daughter who's a freshman in college now, and I have a high school sophomore. And as they are, she had to. So you can um, apply undeclared. But like when I applied, it, no one declared a major. But so many of them, you are applying to certain colleges even as, a, even as a freshman now. And I think that is leading into some of that disconnect. You know, my my freshman who, my, who just finished her year has changed her major three times in, you know, eight months, right? You know, I mean, she went in this pre-med and I think she's coming out as accounting or something. You know, it's it's it, it's a little bit of craziness on that. And I think from some of the studying I've, I've done, I was a K through 12 principal. I put it in my bio. I am a, like a recovering college for everybody I ran a school for low-income students to try to make them college ready, thinking that that's how I was going to solve or contribute to my community. Like that's that's what I was going to do to make a difference until we started finding out that um, there were options that were not only fulfilling and essential, you know, that crazy word I never want to hear, right? Essential is one of those words we can we can ban from the dictionary now. We can be happy. Um, is that I, I wasn't exposed that that was a career. And I from my research and so forth, a lot of that happened post um, kind of World War II. So you you went into that area, that was that 1944 time frame when it started becoming the push towards college rather than hard work. And there's even a poster that says, you know, work smarter rather than harder. And, and that somehow hard work became a bad thing. And, and so I think that's what may have, I believe, led to some of the idea that college. And then we, we, we sold a somewhat of a lie um, I'll say I sold somewhat of a lie that college was a way to escape poverty um, and that college was going to be the answer um, and whether that was basketball. So let's play sports to get you out of poverty, to get you into college, or let's do really good in school to get you out of um, poverty. And, and then what we've done is created a gap of skills that we all need. And we've created a gap of um, with people with education that doesn't necessarily fit what they're passionate about. And we've somehow to an extent as a mom, a high schooler, we're starting to, in my personal opinion, ruin some of high school. You know, my my high schooler can't take the classes that she's like to, that she's to have fun and learn and actually learn about. So she wants to learn about marine biology, but we're telling we her guidance counselor to tell her, no, you need to take AP Physics and AP Calc, AB and Calc, AB BC. And she's like, I hate math, but if you want to get into college, you'll mm -hmm. take these. She's like, but I want to work with sharks. I want to take marine biology. You know, and so 
it has trickled down. And at some point, I believe we're making that turn, kind of like the hurricane that turned off on a far right. We're just not turning quite as quickly as some of those hurricanes. We're kind of turning slowly, but I think we're starting to see that, that gap as a need to fill. And so um, you go back to it, Scott, when you said kind of about accounting or med school, I, I, my personal opinion is in maybe 10 to 15 years, we will see college more as an apprentice program. And many of those, if you look at med school, it really kind of is a really apprentice program, right? Like you are doing related technical instruction during the day and you are interning and doing other programs. And I think we'll see a shift towards that, except for things, engineering is one of the ones I always think of, engineering accounting, where there are actual things you learn in class that are actually applicable to your class. But I think that's where we went, that post, you know, World War II where poverty kind of hit and we wanted to get out of it. And there's that poster that many of us saw. You know, you had the guy working dirty and tired and the guy in a graduation cap and gown and somehow one was better than the other instead of both being great additions to our country. Right. So I, I think that's that's just it, Natasha. And I, I don't know that it was even necessarily that long ago. I think within the last 30 years, we have allowed our public school system to go down the toilet. <laughs> yeah. And and we, we started removing shop classes from school around 30 years ago. And there was, there was economic, purely economic reasoning for that because you can't put a standardized test on a shop class or a home ec class. Um, you, you can't standardize that. And therefore schools can't, can't fight and gain funding. And you know, I could go down a rabbit hole of <laughs> governmental corruption and, and making the people more reliant on government by, by forcing us to not learn how to, how to handle things on our own, how to build, how to create. I don't know how much time we have or, or not, but <laughs> I might have you know, a part two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I think that's just it in that, you know, we've, we've, we've told kids that college has to be the way that if you don't go to college, you're going to be the, the dirty mechanic turning a wrench. And somehow We've made, we've allowed that dirty mechanic to be the, the poster boy for what we don't want in life, mm -hmm. for our children, for our futures, you know, and instead we push kids, you know, 18 year old kids to Scott's point, you know, we push them into college, we wrap them up in, with hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt that many of them will never repay. And, and we kind of kick them off the dock and say, go, go swim and, and let's see what happens when we could, we could change this scenario and start pushing more trade-based education for those kids where it fits, right? College is a great choice for some. Um, I don't want my brain surgeon to come in and tell me that he learned how to do brain surgery by watching YouTube videos, right. <laughs> but it's not the right choice for everybody. And I think there needs to be that, that distinction made and then a, a larger effort to kind of popularize and, and promote trade-based education. And I think it's important just to, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, if, if they, if the folks coming out of college knew that the dirty guy turning the wrench have a better, um, a much better ability to pay the college debt off, then they might actually just went into that right out of the start. Because a lot of folks come out of school and they just want to make as much money as they can. They don't necessarily have us just, that is a high end goal for them at the top of the list of four or five things more than it is. This is my purpose in life and this is how I want to attack it. And for those people in particular, I think you, you might find, go into somewhere where you can get some money, you feel good about yourself, you're making that money. And then maybe you, you find that digging through the mechanic aspect, you love cars and you want to either own a car dealership or you want to bring in exotic cars. You can find your niche in there and then you can go to school for that. And to Soleil's point, you could do that at night or on the internet, or you could go to school. What were you going to add, Natasha? I didn't want to... I know it's always it was just tagging on to it that in as we and that's part of my huge that's why I was in Tallahassee yesterday is working on those trade schools and apprentice programs and and presenting them and this is my big part is not an an alternative to college that is an equal opportunity to college mm -hmm. and that the assumption we need to change the mind frame and so I'll be at the American Guidance Counselors Conference sometime coming up I think in June like gui guidance counselors teachers parents um that it is not the alternative just because your kid is not smart they we will give them a great option that's that is trade school it is that this amazing kid has the option every amazing kid has the option of what is best for their future so is that college is that ct career technical education is that an apprenticeship is that trade school 
And I go back to my daughter who's number five or 10 in her class. So the child's like, you know, she's just got a mind that whirls. They never asked her if she wanted to go to college. Now she probably will. They just assumed that she wanted to. And they were making her drop her career technical education, vet tech. She'll be vet tech certified when she graduates. So she'll probably make more money than me when she, she could if she wanted to, when she graduates high school, right? She's culinary, marine biology. She was, they were telling her she had to drop one of those and not even finding out what her passion was. They just assumed that college was the answer. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the part that I think is the biggest that tag on to what Matt was saying is we've at some point got to figure out what people, students are passionate about or want to do. So then when they go into the workforce, whether it is as an engineer, as in construction, whether it's marketing, um, whether it's running an association, that you can be passionate about it and, and want to go do well. Um, and just assuming that college is it can be, it may be the right thing. Like it, it could be great. It is a great, I, mean, I had a great time in college. Don't get me wrong. I like going back. Um, but I think the same as, I would have done a lot better. My graduate school grades are a lot better than my undergraduate school yeah. grades, you know, because I, I appreciate it. I read books for information rather than the night before hoping I pass an exam. And so right. I, I I think that's the part is in a, it's even lower than high school. We're working with middle schoolers now. So we're working with junior achievement and middle schoolers. Um, and it's like you have this big gap. Everybody remembers kindergarten when you had like, let's learn about the helpers week. So you learned about firemen and you learned about, you know, law enforcement. And did we ever bring in a mechanic? Probably not. But who fixes your car and who builds your building? But then after kindergarten, we stop, right? We forget about any kind of helpers and all we worry about is social emotional learning and this and that. And, and and then it's high school and oh yeah, do you remember in kindergarten, which, which, which helper do you want to be? And so it's that aspect of, you know what, that mechanic turning the wrench may have two Corvettes and a really nice pickup in his backyard too, you know, that he paid for without debt. And um, those are, you gotta, you gotta make construction sexy. Um, that's the, um, that's, so I, I, I love what you just said. We have in Florida, we have, um, we have the, great american teaching i don't know why it's mm -hmm. called the great american when apparently only florida participates in it um but <laughs> but maybe it's just aspirational and we need more states to yes. get on board um but i went and talked to my daughter's kindergarten class about what it meant to be a professional writer like to make writing your career and i was thinking to myself gosh we should really have a campaign where like construction leaders and and laborers come in and talk about what they do for a living like they were interested that i wrote for a living but th what they really wanted was for me to read them a kid's book right because they're kindergartners but if my husband had gone in and brought like duct work and talked about hvac they would have been fascinated because duct work looks cool right like they they're or a bulldozer or an right, excavator or a bulldozer. That they all love as a kid, right that they all exactly that you step on in the middle of the night when you have little kids you know where they right, go just, windows. because the fireman brings the fire truck and the police officer brings her police, uh, her cruiser, you know, so, so bringing back, you know, bringing back the, the fascination with construction as a career and at a young age, I think is an important part. It, I'm interested though, because all of you used the same, you know, dirty mechanic stereotype. And I, I <laughs> <laughs> yes, fair. Um, the, I, I, that is the stereotype around construction, right? There are lots of negative stereotypes around construction and lots of really positive stereotypes around going to college. I am curious if that is a, if there is a chicken and the egg component to the culture problems that we see in construction. Do we have the problems we have in construction in terms of culture because we were painted this way or are we painted this way because we have our culture problems? And anyone who wants to jump in on that question is it's from an outsider's perspective. I am curious about that because my construction career started when I started here at mobilization funding. Well, I think it starts with why is dirty bad, right? So why is getting dirty bad? So, you know, I think that's probably where you, you get it. And uh, yeah, I don't know which psychology, Matt, ch chicken or the egg, which, um, <laughs> you know, what is it? But I, but I think it is that assumption and it goes back to working hard. It's not bad working dirty is not bad and that just to go yeah. you know and it, you know it wasn't bad when you were a kid to get your hands dirty now we sand and you know, sanitize everything um and heaven forbid you know you you eat some dirt um so I, I think it in my opinion it probably starts somehow that dirty is bad and we associated hard work and being sweaty because hey that's hard I don't know when it's I, I think it's our language it's how we communicate it's how we talk about things right when I was in high school 
voc tech is what we called it, right? And, and you could do that, but it was the burnouts, right? It was right. the kids who were barely hanging on to a high school diploma by a thread that would go and do voc tech. And it was, you can go to college and have, have the crown or you can be the burnout and have no options in life. It, it shouldn't be pasted as an alternative. It should just be an option. Yes. Yes, but, I agree. Yeah. But Autumn, to your point about culture, I'm going to push back a bit. I don't think we have a culture problem in construction. I think, I think the, the United States in general as a culture has a problem recognizing that. I think that we have a very vibrant and, and healing uh, culture that I see. I mean, certainly in, in my company, but in, a, in, in the general industry around us, I think the culture is, is there. I think people recognize that you can start as a laborer. You could dig a ditch today, but you could own the excavation company in, in 10 years, in 15 years. And it, you know, I'm not trying to crap on the construction or the, excuse me, the, the college route at all. I just think it, it needs to be on an equal footing as an option and not one better than the other because kids learn differently. Kids have different motivations and we need to, to push that meant that message to create the culture that we want right. in this industry. Right, right, right. Yeah, I agree with Matt that it should be an option and there is a stigma. Um, it's much worse in other cultures outside the, the United States that if you don't go to college, you, you're you doomed to uh, be uh, a low class and so on. Uh, so I think in, in, in Germany, they have the, uh, the vocational route very well, you know, um, disciplined and, and people there are very well respected and so on. And I mentioned to Autumn in a previous conversation that one of the thing, the differences between experience and, and uh, education is that in experience, you learn how to do it. But in education, you know also why you do it this way. So for, for example, in reinforced concrete, and I'm, I'm a concrete kind of person, uh, <laughs> we put the rebar sometimes in the slab, sometimes on the top, sometimes in the bottom. Why do we do that? Uh, it, you know, that when we explain that in, in education. Um, but I want to go back to what, quickly to one point about following your passion. I'm a strong advocate of following my passion and I have five kids, none of them is an engineer. So I didn't put any, any pressure on them. Two of them are in the car industry. One works with uh, BMW, uh, the other one with Nissan. And one uh, whom I envy, I envy my own son, my fourth son, who is crazy about uh, sports, all sports, especially basketball. And, and now he got a job as a event uh, manager, sports event manager in, a, in an international um, academy. So, uh, but at the same time, there is a, 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 a problem with following uh, your passion that you get the tunnel vision. You don't want to learn other supportive uh, subjects and you focus too much on a narrow niche that this is my passion. I don't want to learn anything about marketing, computers, this, this, this. And I think the college education gives you the rounded knowledge, which is really, really important. Um, I'm sure that all of you guys probably listened to J Steve Jobs' commencement speech at Stanford University. And he mentioned how his, those courses he took in graphic design mm -hmm. came back to. So you, this rounded knowledge, let's say history, you took, uh, you know, I had the, uh, uh, issues with my older son who is OCD and who would a some courses take a and other courses flunk them you know he cannot be dumb otherwise he would flunk everything you know <laughs> and he would question dad why I'm, I'm, I'm studying this why should I take a course in history and I said son it's rounded knowledge the rounded knowledge is good if you sit in a in a you know with a bunch of guys discussing history, geography, politics. I think you, you should know a little bit about that. So uh, that's the problem with uh, following your passion blindly without the rounded knowledge. You know, you guys have all touched on something that I, I heard many say in our just collective individual conversations, whether I've talked to you folks or even just our clients. 
And, and it's one thing that I draw attention to is the construction industry, I think is very unique in that if you think about the macro factors of the world that can help you or hurt you, it, it's though if you get those big ones right, you can land on a good path. And I think so often college, you have to, you're forced to focus. We've talked about focusing or know what you want to do or get into the right spot. And, you, and then you have this stigma like healthcare is a doctor or a nurse or construction is turning a wrench or dirty. And in reality, construction, you can do anything in construction. If you start as turning a trend and Matt, you hit the nail on the head, you could be an executive in finance. You can be a laborer. You can be middle, um, senior executive leadership and management, you can be a CEO, you can expand out of construction if you get bored with one scope and there's 50 scopes to go into a building. In addition to that, no matter what is going on in the world, your things are gonna be getting destroyed and things are gonna be getting built. They're gonna be getting rebuilt. The world's gonna change and need new stuff and all of it is construction. And one of the things I like to say is construction is really the heartbeat of of, of America, the country, anything anyone is doing today is directly tied to the construction world. Where we sit, what we do, how we go about, someone had to build it, someone had to create it and construction is attached to it. And so it's this industry that we thought about it like that and you are any type of skill or any type of desire you want, you could, if the message was only, hey, look at construction, you could fit it into the construction industry in all these different 50 different spots and if you try to compare that to other industries, you might not be able to, but there maybe there's only 10 spots you could get into or 20. And if it was framed like that, I think we find a lot more people say, you know what, I'm just going to go get in that industry and I'll figure out what I want to do in any way I can get in, return a wrench or whatever, right. go to school right. first, go to school later. I don't know, do any of you share the same thoughts or have you heard other people frame it that way or what's your just we general do, opinion? We frame it that way a lot when we go into, especially in schools. And so we're, we're obviously always promoting our apprenticeship program. So the idea is after, you know, after high school or even in high school, we'll start you into the apprentice program. And the idea that once you get in, even the electrical industry as a subsection of um, construction is there's HR, there's marketing, there are estimating, there is BIM specialists. Some guys are sitting there that, you know, if you like playing virtual reality at home, you'd be a great BIM specialist, you know, so, you know, there is so many different routes. So we have even from a national level, and from our IEC national organization, as we are out there trying to recruit apprentices, is putting those different levels of where they can be. So I'm a foreman, a superintendent. You might be in the office. You might be doing the estimating. You might be doing the sales. You might be doing the marketing. It's truly a microcosm of college where you can do that, um, where you are dealing with people. And we um, share our office space with one of our contractors. And I love going in there and chatting with them in the, in the cafe area. You could run into the sales guy talking to the low voltage guy. He's talking to the cybersecurity guy. He's talking to the estimating. And everybody's chatting about how, when, where they got to it. But it is an industry that doesn't, doesn't stop. I, when I was driving home from Tallahassee, I was frustrated yesterday on the road because there were a million semis in front of me, right? You know, and they're taking up the road and they're slow. And I was trying to get home. And then I just stopped for a minute. And I was like, you know, two years ago, we were praying for the roads to be back open, right? We, we wanted, you know, trucks and trucks couldn't move. And half those trucks were filled with, you know, lumber and pipes. And, you know, and so I was like, okay, stop. This is your industry. This is what's building. Okay. So I'll just slow down and enjoy the drive. I didn't have anywhere to be, but, but that's the one thing that didn't stop. And, and as to your point, won't stop. I mean, we're in Florida, you're going to need air conditioning. It doesn't matter if anything happens, your air conditioner has to work. You don't, you don't no 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 offense, Matt, but you don't call the you know mental health counselor, the psychologist, or the psychiatrist, no. or or the public relations person. The one thing that you cannot live without in Florida is air conditioning. I mean, you can, you know, we can live without. You know, hurricanes don't scare us unless they're going to turn off our power. And we have generators for air conditioning. Um, you know, nothing else matters, and and so it is a industry and a career for all of those paths. So whether you do go in as an accounting degree or whatnot, it is it is a career that is um, long-term and you can move up in it. I mean, there are ways, there are set paths. Some places you get, you never know where the next step is. There's some clear paths in construction on where you want to go if you want to. And some just absolutely, one of my greatest instructors doesn't want to do anything. He loves being in the field. That's what he loves. Yeah. And I think we all need to realize that that is what some people want to do, be in the field, be outside, be working with your hands. And that is admirable. And that is honorable. And that is an amazing and lucrative with his, I, he's what I joke about, two Corvettes and a pickup truck. Um, 
later. I think to, to follow up on, on Soleil's point about passion, you know, I think a lot of passion is kind of, kind of bullshit, excuse me, but I don't think an 18 year old kid knows what passion is. I think you have to go out and experience life for 10 years, right. 20 years, maybe even longer before you really can even know what your, what your passion is. And I think I did, I did too. And <laughs> I think the, the rounded learning, you know, that you mentioned, I think that's, that's critical. I don't know that it has, I don't think it has to be in college. I think you can get a rounded learning and education through numerous mm -hmm. uh, avenues, but I think that's, that's critical to developing and even finding what our real passions are, you know, internally. Mm -hmm. You're right, Matt. In fact, in fact, I, I can take that uh, in big corporation, big disciplined corporations, when a, uh, a new employee, a young employee comes in fresh from college, they rotate him or her on all, div, uh, you know, uh, divisions. So they, first of all, it's for two purposes. One of the, you should have uh, a mile long inch deep knowledge of everything. The second thing is that to find your passion, you find it only after you experience it. It's not just, and, and uh, I'll, t I'll tell you the um, strangest thing about passion. I was a, a professor at Georgia Southern University in Statesboro, Georgia uh, in the 1990s, between 92 and 98. And one of my best students who was an A student in the program was called construction management. In his third year, he came to me to sign a paper. He said, I'm changing my major. And I said, to what? He said, to history. And I kind of jumped. What? Are you changing from construction management to history? You got to be crazy. He said, I love history. And I said, OK. So I signed the paper. And the, it, it, it was the, uh, I had to mention that story because it stuck in my mind. <laughs> Our, um, our uh, chief customer officer, Joe Andreco, ha uh, recently had a post on LinkedIn about how he his college ma major was art history. Um, and he's like, no, I, 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 don't, I don't necessarily use my art history in, in what I do now, but I, did, but I did learn a lot and I did learn to learn, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, it, what it taught me was was a continuous love of learning and how to be a good learner and I think that's important and to your point Matt I, I agree I don't think that that has to be done in a college setting um, I brag all the time that my husband who has a high school diploma is the one of the most well-read individuals I've ever met he outreads me hands down um, and and is has an incredibly well-rounded education because of it but it all happened you know, on his break in between installing commercial air conditioning systems, because that was his passion. His passion was reading and learning. I want to, um, so we have about 15 minutes left. And one of the things I want to talk about is that higher education, because I used to work in marketing agencies and I did a lot of marketing for colleges and universities, they spend an awful lot of money marketing the idea that their education is the path to following your passion and having two Corvettes and a pickup truck, right? Like they tell a very effective story and, and we don't. We um, Construction as an industry does not spend a lot of money on marketing and especially not on marketing for recruitment purposes. So my question to you guys is what could construction companies be doing that would help tell the story of the potential of our industry to those younger audiences. Um, Natasha, I know you guys do a ton of work with, with yeah. young, younger audiences, but, but also like what can the actual companies be doing to take control of that narrative? I mean, get out and, and talk to these kids. Exactly what Natasha's doing, exactly what we're doing. We talk to, to local high schools constantly. Uh, we, we started a, a high school aged internship program this year, just to, to kind of give kids an opportunity to, you know, step up into our world and, and just see what it looks like. And we give them the, the flexibility that they can come in, they can pick which route they want to see. They can come and hang out with me and, and do estimates and, and talk about marketing and sales. I can put them in the field with my superintendent and they can get dirty, you know, whichever area they can, they can run social media, you know, but, but I think that's the, the critical nature of it is because we don't spend a lot of money on it, 
but we're also fighting, you know, 30, 40 years of, mm-hmm. of a mentality that we're trying to shift. And the only way to do that is, you know, without blowing up the complete education system, the only way to do that is to, to reach these kids early enough to give them the opportunity to make those decisions for themselves. Mm-hmm. And I, and I think it's just through talking, you know, we, we can only do so much. Okay. Well, I think you should just blow up the education system. You know, like, you well, know, I'm, I'm, I'm all for that. For that. But no, Matt is like on a mission. <laughs> there's, a, there's a couple of things that we've identified too, that I think is important that we've talked about. Um, and, and a lot of it is it, it we've done is, is making sure that our, our teammates that are in the construction industry with us are proud of what they do and talk about it and don't say, I'm just of this. I'm just of that, you know, because you're not, it's just, it's the same thing as I'm just a stay at home mom or I'm, I'm just a project manager. I'm, I'm, I'm just an electrician. You know, those are a part of that is changing that. And part of it is, and this, I'm going to use my, um, my master's degree from it. It is being involved in um, the politics of the literal government of your um, chamber of commerce, politics, school board elections, and is making your voice heard. And that is one aspect that we do with our association is that we are, we try to get behind those people that are not only, um, for small business and you know for businesses and large is, is making sure that it's people that are understanding those options is and we learned more than anything during this pandemic that school boards are very powerful in what schools stay open and if they're wearing masks or not and if they're enjoying school and and we are lucky here in florida that we are not experiencing a lot of what other places are but i think it is you know being proud of what you're doing it is getting involved in the politics and it's like matt said it is getting in the schools however you can whatever toe you have to be in is, you know, volunteering, however you, you know, being involved in, you know, the Pop Warner footballs that are around, you know, talking to those kids, the junior achievements in your area, the great American teaching, whether it's the great Florida teaching or not, I don't know, whatever it is, it is, it is being in there and being proud of what you're doing and sharing it. Um, is how that will be. That being said, we're also spending a crap ton of money right now, right now here in, in Tampa on doing some billboards about um, Built by You. That's one of our new things we're doing with HCC, Built by You, and just really showing the images of um, what people are building. And, and it is social media advertising. And if I could figure out a TikTok for some construction electrician to do, that would be a, that would catch on. I, I'd be behind that. And, um, and sometimes it may seem, um, some of it may be what we joke about a little bit silly or whatnot, but um, to grab that age group that we need to, to fill, I'm sure it's the same in construction. We have more electricians who retire every day than I can bring into the industry. So I have to grab their attention. I have to do it quickly, but they have to see people they want to be like. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that is, that's the part of putting it out there. So, it, you know, if you're not involved in your chamber or your local association, whether it's ABC or IEC or whatever, you know, union it is in that area, those are the areas I think that need to start to make those differences so that you do have those options. And, you, and go where they are is really what I'm hearing you say, go where they yeah. are and they're online, go online, showcase the job sites. I mean, the, some of the coolest mm-hmm. stuff I see on LinkedIn or social media is a construction site and the video right. attached to it and the, the, what it looked like before and what it looks like after by, you know, and, and you use the, the bulldozer analogy we were talking about before. I mean, two guys in a bulldozer for five days can have the most, some of the most <laughs> impressive video from start to finish in a five day period than anything you could possibly see on LinkedIn. And if all of a sudden you attach, like, here's what these folks make to every single one of those, someone might say, you know what, that's awesome. I, I thought in accounting, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to make X. And by the way, the correlation in those worlds, they have no idea. If you put a dollar sign of what the person's making in accounting after a four-year degree next to their, the perception might think, oh my gosh, this was so much more and wow, what less? And the perception of what they thought the person, the bulldozer was making compared to what they, what they are making, they might be like running towards that bulldozer. So I think the marketing aspect of just that alone would be so critical to helping shape some of the perspectives that people have just so it's a fair perspective, just so someone's not thinking the wrong thing. Yeah. You, you, exactly call, it, you call it marketing and, and, you know, it's, it's marketing slash education. And yeah, I right. think, you know, fo- um, following your passion requires you to know all the options. I mean, it, you may find somebody who likes certain type of food this is my, you know, favorite food. Have you tried other types of food? Right. <laughs> you know? So I think you, the trade schools that Matt 
talked about was was a great um you know I, I i remember in college we took trades you know welding and and uh, carpentry and so on it's a, it's a good thing when you have a rot rotational uh, system that you you get exposed to everything and after that you tell me you, you know mm -hmm. which one you you fell in love with yeah i had a mentor tell me once start listening to people not the tv you know don't listen to the government or the they follow find a person that you like someone that's a human that you know their name and like you don't have to know them but you at least know it's a person you're listening to not a they or a, a them or a government entity or the state right. says or the cdc like the, the, find the human at a place and not just the place and i thought it was good in perspective and it's really helped me a ton many decades ago later yeah we have just a few minutes left and we do have a question. Um, Jeffrey asks, one thing I've always found missing from the trades is a clear career path. Some unions do well at this, but the building industry in general has done poorly in explaining how a young person can go from laborer to manager and defining that path. So who wants to respond to Jeffrey's comment? He's spot on. He's, 100%. He's spot on. Yeah, and and I think, you know, I got, that's literally what we're, um, I, like I said, I sit on our national board for, for IEC, um, and that's what we're, we are trying to delineate, and we're trying to work out what is that path so that we can explain. Helper, apprentice, electrician, foreman, superintendent, you know, project manager, what's next, and, and then the salaries and dollars that go with it. Um, and some of them then, you know, the, it'll split out, and there is, that is part of the education that we have not told them that you can spend four years in college and go be an accountant and spend four or five years and then you get to be a senior accountant or you can spend four years as an apprentice working you're probably a good superintendent by the time you get out of that apprentice program if you work for one com company and so um we've done a poor job and i think that is part of the marketing that has to be done is to show those and not just to the student and not just to the employee that has to be shown to the guidance counselor and the parent i mean let's be you know those parents want to say my kid went to XYZ college. That's right. why, you know, 70,000 people apply to Harvard when they're going to accept 3,000. They just want to say, we know where they went. So it needs to be, this is the path. But it's interesting because how many people really know the path of a CEO? You know, how did you, how many people really know the path of an accountant? But because those came from college, somehow that gets to trump the what is the, the plan, you know, um, for a, a construction, someone in the construction industry, but we do, we have to take extra steps that we maybe didn't before. It's interesting because I'm thinking from, from a marketing standpoint, because I always am, that's an easy, right. that's an easy TikTok to make right. actually, to show right. a person, you know, labor and what they make. Yeah. And then one year later and what they make yeah. and, and show that progression. I mean, that's an, that's an easy viral. I'll find some, TikTok. I'll find some good, yeah, don't ever vote I have that one post that went viral on LinkedIn. It's like 1.6 million views. It's the worst thing in your entire life to go viral because it dings all night on LinkedIn. Bing, bing, <laughs> bing. And if you turn it off and somebody disagrees with you and you haven't responded. So, um, but yes, a, a viral, it would be an easy viral Instagram. But, um, but it's funny that, that that post is exactly what we're talking about essentially is, is normalizing the idea that the four-year trade school is as good as a four-year college. If, if I can add one thing quickly here, uh, in the path itself, there are paths, not just one. Mm -hmm. um, many people don't understand that, that, that having a technical skills does not necessarily mean that you can run an organization that if you are a, a, a good in, in repair of uh, HVAC, you mentioned HVAC, okay. You may be a brilliant uh, technician, but a miserable manager. Right. Uh, those kind of skills, some of them you're born with and some of them you have to polish those, those skills. Uh, I know I have a, a brother-in-law who now passed away who was a great uh, uh, chef in, in culinary school and he worked with the Disney Corporation. You know, he was brilliant. He tried to run his own business and he failed miserably. So, um, and some people are, by nature, uh, entrepreneurs, they, they, they want to do their own business. Some of them are better 
stay as employ uh, employees for the rest of their lives. So uh, I don't know how to put it, but uh, you need to learn the, the skills required because before uh, and, and be ready before you jump in. Mm -hmm. That's so true. That's so true. One of our um, podcast this season, um, uh, we have a podcast called The Real MFers. If you haven't subscribed yet, please go subscribe after the end of this webinar. Um, it's available everywhere you get your pods. But one of our, one of the episodes was with a business owner, Calvin Weathersby, and he talked about how he meets with his team and asks them what they're, what they want to accomplish. You know, where do you see yourself in three years, five years? And then he actually works with them to create their path because you're right, when you walk into college, they're like, oh, you're going for English? Well, then you want to be an English teacher. Here are the courses you have to take. This is your path. But I went to college for English and I didn't want to be an English teacher. That sounded like hell on earth to me. I, <laughs> and I'm pretty sure it still is. Like, I don't want to do that. Um, but no one said to me, you could get into marketing or you could be an editor or you could, there was just one path and it didn't work for me. So we, we need to get better about showing that there are lots of paths you know, to, to entrepreneurialism, to, and, to, to, to whatever it is you want to accomplish. And, and it's not mutually ex exclusive. I mean, we talked about like my students who are my apprentices are in college. So right. they're taking RTI related technical instruction right. from us. They are doing four years at the college. They walk out with 32 to 46 college credits if they want to go take the next step. Mm -hmm. And we're doing a horrible job of explaining that too. It's like a, it's like a community college scholarship that, that it doesn't mean this is the end. Mm -hmm. It goes back kind of thing what Scott said at the beginning. I'd have been a much better college student if I'd done something else a few years yeah. before I got into college. <laughs> Even just a couple. Yeah. Yep. I worked all through college. So oh, I worked all through it, but I was just working in the football office. Yeah. So, so <laughs> that meant good next, tickets. On the next webinar, we'll talk about having your phone or your face stuffed in your phone for eight hours a day isn't going to help you either. Um, but I'll save that for my parental conversations that I'm suffering through on my own child, children. <laughs> We're going to talk about how to get your kid to watch less YouTube. Zero value for that what one you're doing at the moment. Yes. Spot on. Nor will there be many scholarships that will come out of that to pay for college if you can decide right. to go that direction. Um, that is right. Well, that is our time for today. Um, I can't thank you all enough for taking time out of your busy days to join us for this conversation. Um, it was hugely valuable for our audience and super entertaining to be a part of. So thank you. Thanks for having us. I mean, this, this, this is a awesome. conversation. I appreciate that, it. This could have gone three hours. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> for all three of you, if there's anything that Autumn and I can do or through us that can help you in creating that meme, that TikTok, um, a slide, um, anything that you could use with your network, let us know. I'd love to be able to give that to you guys as our gift um, for you. If it's a way of helping we, with different contacts we have, if you said, hey, it'd be great if I had a video that did this, this, and this, and it was some cartoon yeah. and you could utilize it, task us with doing that. Um, you tell us how and we'll do it. And I'd love to make that part of what you guys can push out from here to actually make it more than just a one hour conversation and actually turn yeah. it into a producible result. So. Absolutely. I may, I, may, I, have, I may have to do that. That TikTok does. Like now it's spinning my head. I'm like, we can yeah. just pop point, 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 point. I'm like, I'm going through all the stupid dances yeah. and the stupid Instagram I watch. I'm like, mm, we have to get together, Autumn. Email yeah. me. Yeah. We'll, we'll have coffee. Awesome. We'll talk. I yeah, love you that. Just stuff. Email, text us what it is. If I had this, I could do this much more of it and we'll do it. Awesome. We'll make it happen. We'll, we'll you <laughs> ask us with figuring it out and we'll deliver it. Awesome. Just let us know what would be the thing that would help. Yep. Awesome. Thank, Thank you all you. so much. All right. Take Thank care. You. Bye, Bye. Bye, everybody. Appreciate it. Take care. Take all care. right.